Uh, last but by no means least, uh, Matthew Brooker, Donald, and Alan Brook. And I've been instructed to just give the first line of the title so if you think I'm getting lazy later in the day, it's not true. Uh, a fresh start on the other side of the world. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, as you see, this is a, a multidisciplinary view. Um, Angela Gurr, and a lot of this work is based on her PhD, which has just gone through in the last couple of weeks and has won a university award um, there. And uh, she may well be online, but it's it's a little bit sort of early morning after midnight in Adelaide. So I don't know if she'll be able to be online there. But Angela's brought up the background in anthropology and archaeology. Uh, with her PhD. Uh, Matt, who you already know as the data scientist and the corpus uh, linguist and, and so on. And myself, I'm a clinician and a basic science researcher in craniofacial biology. Um, and so that's the multidisciplinary team. And we'll be presenting to you with three components uh, to this. Uh, first of all, on the establishment, the background uh, to the early history of this new British colony of South Australia. And then Matt will take over to go through the health blogs about that voyage from England out to South Australia. And then I'll come back to look at the matter of the health of these early migrants and what for some of them was the outcome when they'd actually got there. We begin then with the revolting Americans, well, sorry, the Americans in revolution. Um, uh, this is the Boston Tea Party and they're pouring all of that precious, lovely tea into the sea and polluting it. Um, but of course, that's the start of the loss of the American colonies for Britain. And then we have the French Revolution with the storming of the Bastille and then Madame Guillotine and the loss of all of the aristocracy and the British aristocracy is starting to get worried. Because at home, then they've got the Luddite movement going on with the early part of the Industrial Revolution and the, uh, the smashing of machines there. And so that they are very much on edge, even having won the Napoleonic Wars. Um, then a few years afterwards in 1819, there's this uh, demonstration uh, that takes place and the cavalry is sent to police it and suddenly intervenes and creates the Peterloo massacre. So there's a lot that's happening politically. And at the same time, there's this the extremes, the, the basis of which some of which we see around us here. And that with the superb buildings that were being put up during this period uh, and the wealth that was being uh, demonstrated and shown very much and the poor living in terrible conditions uh, and so much so that when the American ambassador uh, commented in 1816 he said the extremes of opulence and of want are more remarkable and more constantly obvious in this country than in any other I ever saw the crowding and the deprivation and the real poverty and the disease, not only in London, but in Birmingham and in Manchester. How was this to be alleviated? Well, there were those who felt altruistic about it and that Edward Gibbon Wakefield actually uh, wrote a document uh, there suggesting the formation of new colonies. He wasn't specifically saying South Australia, but he was talking possibly Canada, possibly New Zealand, uh, which would also be there, but South Australia as well. The other parts of Australia had already been uh, sort of colonised with convicts and they'd been sent out there on the ships. But now there was 
according to Gillen, the chance of forming these new colonies. Well, at the same time, Sturt and others were exploring the coast and going up the River Murray inland into South Australia and seeing that it was indeed a very suitable place that could have good agriculture there and possibly more um, that would be available. The news came back and the financiers then became involved. Robert Gouger um, campaigned for the formation of a colony and even went on and formed a South Australia uh, colony, uh, a South Australia uh, company to lobby for it. The political emphasis that we'd seen, first of all, now also came into that and the uh, Parliament passed the South Australia Act. Of course, two years before, there'd been that very important act, the Great Reform Act, when the rotten boroughs had been dealt away with and where now there was a wider franchise and a wider representation, we would say all too narrow, but in those days, actually a wider representation in Parliament and the opportunity was seen of the South Australia Act and then came to be the start of the recruitment campaign and then the uh, voyage over to uh, South Australia and setting up a government out there. So out of that brief background there, we've seen three things coming together. The altruism to try and set up a new colony that would give poor people the possibility of a new start on the other side of the world. That's uh, what's behind Wakefield's uh, approach there. And then the finance comes in and sees that there's a real opportunity to make some money here. And politically, this is seen as at least partly dealing with the sort of problems that we started laying out. Interestingly, these are the three components that uh, actually, Lord Jonathan Sachs, uh, the recent, the, the uh, recently died uh, chief uh, rabbi uh, and philosopher, had actually said, this is for any state. But it was the coming together of these three things that actually brought about the change of uh, formation of South Australia. So, what do you do? You must advertise to actually recruit people to go and to give those who needed a, a free passage out there. Now, you need to set up the state a bit like Britain, and therefore it's got to have some class structure. And you do need a minor aristocracy who will go out there and see their opportunity and have land there. And then you'll have to have a middle class who are the doctors and other professionals and, and so on who will go. But then you've got to recruit too. You've got to recruit your skilled artisans, your blacksmiths and your brick makers and uh, uh, school teachers uh, there in the third class. And then you've got your need for labourers, agricultural labourers and those who will work in other potential industries out there. So to get the third and the fourth groups to sign up, you produce a beautiful advert, which of course, like modern advertising, is absolutely to be trusted <laughs> and will be there when you uh, just what you want when you get there. So there's going to be this sort of idyllic situation in which the sheep will lie down quietly while they are sheared and uh, in, in which the dogs, the sheep dogs are very well behaved and you walk around and uh, then when you, uh, the fields are to be ploughed and so on, that's very pleasant. Oh, and actually when you arrive, it's going to be idyllic like this for your family that you're taking out with you. The, the encouragement was for young families actually to go out. But of course, to get there, you've got the voyage. But the voyage is portrayed here with a very calm sea and there. And for those who were, had come from poverty and had dry, you know, really 
terrible situation. This was a bit like it advertises a cruise ship to take them out to South Australia. So now we go on to the voyage and we move on to the corpus linguistics about that. Thanks. Um, yeah, and so my parents now live in Adelaide and I'm in America. The idea and getting over to see them is, is really challenging. It's a long journey with modern travel. But just think about this for these people that that just described there. This is excitement. The first time probably they've been on anything like this is the journey. Um, and it's a very treacherous journey hitting these points around here. Um, Take somewhere between 90 days, 120 days. Some in our reports even go over that 143 days as one uh, of the ones that we have. And so on these journeys then, um, thinking about some of the risks to health on the voyage. Um, obviously right at the beginning, maybe throughout for a lot of people, there was extreme seasickness, um, particularly where we're starting off and, and coming out around there. Um, and then the spread of disease itself on the ship could be people uh, coming on with this excitement, uh, not having great health to start with, um, or bringing um, in infections on. Um, water supply for 90 days onwards, 120 days was a problem, fresh water supply. Uh, there were some innovations as time went on about machines that could take salt water and turn it into fresh water, um, but that was an ongoing problem and water going bad. Food, similar. Uh, there was a number of stops where they try and pick up fresh supplies, but there was uh, a real lack of fresh uh, food, meat and fruit. Um, some of the early journeys were 500, 600 passengers being carried on, on these ships. Um, that tended to go down over time, but still there was an issue of cleanliness and keeping um, the ship clean. All of the lower, the, 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 the kind of three and four class people were in steerage at the bottom. Um, and those are the ones that were getting this free package. And there was poor ventilation. Again, there were some innovations as time went on, but uh, tended to be a lot of flooding down there, that mold. Um, and then childbirth um, happened a lot for, for young families, um, various accidents and so on. And so these are some of the health risks that kind of we've been interested to try and understand. Um, and taking an approach of trying to build a data archive uh, and a corpus together using the available rec records and documents that, that are there for this, um, for these voyages, starting from um, 1836 and going through to 1875. And what you see here is just the number of voyages so far in our archive per year. Um, and you can see that there are two major peaks there uh, and then a downturn and uh, uh, kind of a, a, a lower peak there across there. But where we have sort of above 10, um, going throughout apart from these periods here where we have um, we have the first kind of downturn in the colony um, and there were a lack of jobs that people were being brought over to do and there was even the establishment in Adelaide of a poor asylum for those who were unable to find work and then in the second period where we had the south turn there was suddenly a discovery of metal some gold and other metals and we needed miners to come over um, for that so that gives a sort of trajectory of what it looked like in terms of the number of voyages that were going on and key to uh what you know on each of these ships certainly from the from the 1850s onwards um particularly but even before that you remember that there's hundreds of years of kind of uh of sea travel um out to other other colonies um and that's something britain did really well so this surgeon superintendent role wasn't something entirely new um but in this case these are the features of, of that role. It had to be a qualified medical practitioner, uh, was privately appointed to go along with the voyage, so wasn't part of the crew, but yet lived in the cabins um, and interfaced uh, with the captain and the crew. And his responsibility was for the emigrants. And you think primarily that would be medical assistance, um, but actually that was a, a, turned out to be a minor part of his role, um, really ma maintaining cleanliness on the ship. Um, and of the emigrants, um, making sure they had baths, making sure that the kids had their hair cut and so on, um, making sure and keeping track of the food and water supply. Um, and then these two are really interesting. There was very much emphasis on discipline um, and keeping things in order and obtain, uh, uh, upholding the morals, um, particularly for the young single women <laughs> who are on the trip. Um, 
And so very quickly, you start to see these stories and controversies around this role. So uh, in the Lancet in, in 1850, uh, there were these stories of these terrible voyages where they, there had been a breakdown of order and the ship superintendent was responsible for that. And there had been intercourse between um, the, the sailors and the young women and all sorts of things were going on. So there was a lot of legislation that came in and um, a whole series of records that they had to keep. Um, and their pay for the voyage was tied to a good report um, when they when they arrived. And so you can just see a few examples here. This is about where what, what level of sickness there was on the voyage um, and where it was in the ship. Um, and so there was a great deal of simple diarrhea among children in the commencement of the voyage, but it did not prevail more in one part of the ship than another. That's the kind of thing that the um, surgeon superintendent would write on the end. And then here, this is interesting about the immigrants themselves, what was their general conduct, especially that of the single female. Uh, in cases of serious misconduct, state names and particulars. And so you can see a few examples here. I can show you this one here. The Cornish miners, so this is that second period, gave me a great deal of trouble, especially the single men. Um, the single girls conducted themselves in a very orderly manner. So we have that sort of information from some of these records, a lot of them are digitized but not transcribed. So we're working to kind of take the ones that are transcribed and then add in to that. Uh, and then the key part are the, the section of these reports with the death records. So the record of birth and deaths, the names, dates, and the cause of death. And so we're using that in our archive at, uh, from where the records become really good, um, 1849 onwards, um, up to 1875. And you can see here, this is the number of deaths per year across those voyages. And so that again shows you that in this early period up to 1859 is where we see, we saw that first peak of voyages, but also that's where we have the largest mortality on these voyages. Um, and then from that, we have um, almost 1,200 deaths from 163 voyages during that time period. Um, about a third of them, we don't have any cause of death recorded, but these are the top 15 where we do have a record of that. And so you can just see from a quick look over these, um, a lot of these, uh, there are some um, infectious ones, measles, um, cholera, typhoid, um, but a lot of these, there's a mixture of kind of cause of death and symptoms that come from uh, the voyage, and particularly these, uh, the, the largest numbers we'll see when we look at age are amongst young children and infants in particular. Um, and just pay attention to this and hold on to this from Erasmus, sort of uh, severe malnutrition and wasting, um, and we'll come back and, and look at that. If we just look quickly at the causes of death over time, and here are some of the sort of the more common ones that you'd expect to just follow the trajectory of where there are the most voyages, because those would occur across any voyage, and here are the infectious ones where there are probably outbreaks um, across time. And then uh, putting together the, the death uh, during this time period by age groups, you can see um, infants under one, children under one, then one to four are the two that take up the majority of that. Um, and then pretty constant above that, apart from in this 20 to 29 age group there. So that's how our, our data on mortality on these voyages during this period breaks out. And so then what we've been starting to do is to think about what can we build around the archive here? Um, and so during this period, we've got uh, the Lancet um, starting sort of going back to 1823, and we put that together. And taking the approach is to look at these causes of death and then to locate them within that to see what would be the understanding at the time, what things were being said about, about that. Pick this one because it's pediatric dentistry, interesting. Um, got to move on with that. But then from that, we can see, again, we can see from our causes of death over time, what the trajectory looks like. And then just using the Lancet corpus that we've been able to scrape, look at mentions of those terms across time and use that as a starting point then to start to see what the understanding was and what sort of discourse. And again, from that, we can take uh, in the Lancet corpus that we have, start with one of the causes of death or disease that we're interested in, then do our standard corpus analysis. And so this is just a quick collocation um, analysis. Unfortunately, I haven't got time to, to delve into there, but you can see how that goes. And then coming back quickly to this, um, with the other approach that we're taking is then looking at where we have these peaks. And so I tell my students never to put a second y axis on the chart, but I've done it here, the ratio of deaths per ship during a year and where these peaks are from these three bars. There are three ships of interest. Um, the first is the Douglas, which is called the Death Ship. 
And this is really interesting from the, the news. The, the other part of our corpus is collecting together any news articles that we can find that relate to these voyages. Uh, and so in 1850, there was the ship, the Douglas, that got coined as the death ship. Um, they had stalked over the waters and the shark and the porpoise had made many a meal of human carcasses supplied from the cholera ship. This was one of those outbreaks. So, um, the second one then in 1853, about 10% of the 600 passengers um, lost their lives. Um, the Morning Star is an interesting one in 1863 because at first the newspaper report was very positive and focused on um, here's the ship superintendent. Uh, and the satisfaction on landing this report that they got. And there's some, even some innovations because he liked the idea of, trying, of not using hammocks, but using cots. And this seemed like a good innovation for that. But it turned out that actually there have been 24 deaths on this ship. Um, and so the follow up report to that um, focused in on that. And then just quickly, the last bit before I pass back to David, just conclude. Um, the last bit that we're trying to get together, this is tricky because they are, again, available um, digitized but not transcribed is the day by day logs that the uh, surgeon superintendents kept. And so we've been able to find a few, uh, and from that, they kept using a compass to find interesting to plot the turn there, um, what they plotted there, and to, to show the trajectory of the journey. And the idea then would be to look at when they mentioned sea thickness and so on, where are those things, where there are deaths, we can plot them across time. So that's part of our vision for going with that. These are what some of them look like day by day, sort of log of what's going on. <laughs> and you can see here uh, a medical um, uh, delivery, helping deliver a child. Then actually this moral part, there's a dispute between a husband and wife uh, and, and so on. And so then we can also do some analysis from that. Thanks. Now they've got there and they've settled we've been able to look at a group who were living um, five miles south of the centre of the city of Adelaide, the CBD, which had been set up as a mile square in each dimension. And this is the area of St Mary's. And at that time, this is 1847, then there's the St Mary's Church and it's surrounded by a lot of uh, green fields and it has its cemetery around it. Now, because in the early time uh, that we're looking at now, life was hard, then there was a government funding for actually burying those who had died with no money to pay for a proper burial. So this was the so-called free ground area, although there are other parts of the cemetery where those from the uh, sort of uh, those who could afford it uh, were uh, buried with big gravestones and so on. Of course, the free ground area is tucked round the back. And then when you get buried in there, there's there's no marking of your grave that you can't identify in that way the individuals. But that's where the corpus comes in again, very helpfully, because there were parish records kept of who was included there, but that doesn't tie up with the particular skeleton that you're looking at there. A little while ago, back in about 2000, then the parish wanted to be able to reuse this area of the cemetery that had been designated for these free burials. There were now no longer the need for any free burials and an excavation was allowed of all those who were uh, in St Mary's there. And that's the group that the, the results I'll now show you uh, actually come from. There are 65 that we've been able to, um, to, to study there uh, on that. There are 20 um, uh, adults and there are 45 uh, pre adult. First of all, not surprisingly from me, we'll look at the teeth. Um, and what we see, and this is a teenager, as we can tell from his dentition, the stage of his dentition, and you notice that he's got a large carious cavity here. And uh, actually, when you look at it in the other 
dimension, then that has caused an abscess, which has uh, come through the bone and drained out there, and has also caused the loss of a lot of bone locally around there. And when we look at the radiograph here, then we see again these points where there's been bony loss caused by this. This would have been extremely painful. He obviously couldn't afford to have this treated, um, although there was uh, by now uh, sort of some very good high class dentists back in the CBD in Adelaide there. Um, and that, but he would have suffered from this and it, it, you know, it wouldn't have helped his general health or eating either. Over on the left hand side, we're actually looking at, an, uh, at someone who's rather older than that, um, certainly into their 40s. And then you, we see they've got a lot of bone loss around their teeth. They've got severe periodontal disease and circled there is that notch on the tooth. And that tells us that this individual smoked a clay pipe. And that, so that we know that he, too, he then was a smoker, that it was, uh, and was affected by that. Here's another um, adult that we've been able to look at. And you see uh, this person also, um, and we know because you can sex the skeletons that this is not a male, um, but actually um, there's been a lot of uh, tooth loss and bone loss, and that too would have affected general health and the ability to eat uh, well on that. But what is also particularly of interest for that individual is the marks on the teeth here, the pits and the lines that you see on there, and they are developmental defects while the teeth were forming. And that tells us that this individual then had recurrent illnesses when they were young. That may have been back in the UK, or it may have been that this individual who we can't uh, know exactly when they died, they may have been born in uh, South Australia and then have experienced these recurrent illnesses, which were severe, but not severe enough to kill them. So that's information that we know from looking at the teeth there. And this uh, slide here uh, shows what we're looking at with these dental defects actually within the tooth. This is called interglobular dentine. It's in the inner section of the tooth there and is associated also with externally enamel defects of the sort that you're looking at there on the other slide. We've been able to gain this by using a new technique called large volume micro CT. Um, and that's the first time that it's actually been used in archaeology. And the advantage is that we can now take a whole skull and look at that at one time. And we haven't got to do anything destructive and with these very rare specimens. And this is the only um, group that there is in Australia where we've been able to look at these settlers who were not uh, sort of uh, out there originally as convicts. So we've got the innovation in the study uh, technically uh, as well here. Uh, and then that's showing us about their general health. When we move on to look at general health, then we see that actually there are signs of vitamin C deficiencies and iron deficiencies tying back to things that Matt was talking about there. And we can tell that from the bones by this porosity. And so there are porous lesions, and this is the orbit, the roof of the orbit, the roof of the eye socket. In summary, the sort of things that we've been able to see uh, from this dental and skeletal examination is that there are signs of a dietary deficiency in vitamin C and iron. Surprise, not surprisingly, in South Australia, they weren't suffering from vitamin D deficiency because of the sunshine. Um, there we've seen smoking, uh, poor oral health, and that's related to poor general health and illnesses in childhood from their developmental defects. There were signs on the skeletons of very hard physical labour over many years causing crippling um, uh, 
situations. Uh, and yet, available, as we've seen for that teenager, there was limited dental or health care. And in these early years, uh, there was that economic depression. And that tied in with what Matt was saying about the time when there had been many voyages out there and then suddenly there came a much lower time because there was just not the work for the people who were then being taken out there. And of course, for some of them, they would have been without family support. On the left hand side, there's the evidence of the hard physical labour affecting the spine and that and the sort of things were some of these people uh, here, there were mines near this area in St Mary's and they would have been working there as they are on site. But to come to the conclusion of our presentation, we want particularly to look at this gentleman. When that skull was first looked at by one of our eminent colleagues, Professor of Anthropology, um, then he published a paper uh, there suggesting that this individual might actually have been a criminal who was hung uh, there from some of the injuries. But as we, uh, together with him, looked again at that, we saw the very extensive injuries that you see there, the, the sort of fractures of the skull and so on, that would not have occurred normally with hanging. Um, and so we started to question, well, what's the background then? How has this individual died? And that's when we turn to the corpus. Then, uh, and playing a part in the story uh, is these, that actually, um, for example, to transport things from the central uh, Adelaide from the CBD down the five miles to St Mary's, you would actually have a, a team of oxen uh, like this. And guiding that team of oxen, you would have someone out the front, and then you would have the um, uh, somebody as the driver, and uh, on top of some of the bales, you might well sit a third person. Yeah, okay. it's okay. to We've turned then to a coroner's report and also the newspapers, uh, uh, the newspapers report of the coroner's inquest. And what we found for that individual was that they actually uh, were a farmer named John Pell and that they met with the most fearful accident. And what had happened was that he had been sitting on top of the ox cart and he had had quite a lot to drink that day when they went into the CBD and that he had then as we read here the body presented an appalling spectacle all traces of human features were uh, dislocated uh, there and uh, then his uh, brother-in-law the farmer stated that the deceased was my brother-in-law. Last evening, about nine o'clock, uh, I was travelling from the town with the dray and in the company of his own brother uh, and the deceased. And he was driving, Sam Broughton was driving, that the brother, his brother, was out the front guiding the oxen uh, there and the deceased was sitting on the load, which consisted of tea and sugar and other stores. Again, very interested insight into what the diet was, that it was actually still the same sort of poor diet that they might have had in England, where they were, this was a year's supply they were getting, and it consisted of these things. And then um, at the time of the accident, I looked back and I missed him from sitting on top of the dray, and he had fallen off the dray under the wheel, and those fractures of his skull were where the wheel uh, of the ox cart had gone over him. Um, and uh, 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 I stopped the drain quickly as I could and I went back, but he was uh, just two yards behind the, the drain and dead. So this is how the, with these different parts of the uh, investigation have come together and how corpus has played an important role in that.
So we have had a multidisciplinary study and that, that is really uh, ongoing now uh, to establish these things here and would like to conclude the advertisement again, but thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Well don't mind, but I did say that they would have extra time as they're in the last slot and we have the time for survival. Okay, well that was very interesting. I think in, in some ways it echoes but amplifies other things we've seen in the conference, which is multiple sources of digital evidence becoming available, which you can actually assemble around a single research question and get a deeper insight into it than any one source of evidence might provide. So that's fascinating. And you know, I was sitting there thinking of other sources of evidence you might get too. So for example, comparing those um, patterns of mortality to general patterns of mortality, yeah. how atypical was it? Similarly with age, for example, you could do it further. Also checking cholera outbreaks. Yeah. Was there a cholera? All of these things are now possible yeah. and track them. As we saw with some of the others that you can do the cleanly, you can start to draw on these yeah, pieces of evidence in ways which at the start of my career or your career, you know, pretty much infeasible apart from anything yeah. else. You can imagine it might be possible, but even a fraction of what you presented today would be enormously difficult. Alchadeb, I think we've got time for one question. So we've got a question, a burning question yeah. about coming to this side of the winner. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. I was looking at them and they they just kept repeating the question or the, the phrases from the question or the words from the, the, quest, uh, the, the yes. suggestion. Do you think they are the line? Or are they just sort of? Well, yeah, so certainly their, their pay was based on, you know, delivering the emigrants in good health, a clean ship and all of those reports. And so, yeah, they did. You're right, exactly do that. So that example, the Morning Star, that the last example was where at first it seems that was the case uh, and it's not clear why the 24 deaths weren't more you know in that box that was what was the health like what were the health problems um so that's where a lot of this controversy goes on when you look in even in the same newspaper so the south australian register is where a lot every time a ship came in there would be a shipping report new to our colony this many new emigrants of this kind uh doctor such and such delivered uh you know a clean voyage and these sorts of things you know um then there would be some controversy. Some of the passengers would, you know, bring cases against um, some of the ship superintendents or some. So all of that is going on. Yeah. So I, I, I'm, I'm, yeah. When I look at them, I'm like, yeah, they're just kind of writing, yes, satisfactory, satisfactory, very good, right? So yeah. Well, I suppose that's where the sort of assemblage of evidence that you have is useful, right. because if you are only looking at those logs, it would be really problematic. But because you can look at that range of evidence like the newspaper yeah. articles, for example, you can say actually he was doing this for the money. Yeah. And it was and it was shown not to be true at the time. Yeah. And then also, I suppose if I flip the coin, I'd say on those occasions when you do see fuller entries, it's a sign that this is something truly out of the ordinary, right. either an exceptionally honest fool, yeah. or it was so bad they had to <laughs> <laughs> <something, right>? yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but to your, there has been some work done and Haynes has done some work which showed that actually for uh, maternal mortality, uh, mortality during childbirth was lower on the ships yeah. than it was from where they were coming from. Right. So, you know, your point is very well taken on that. Yeah. And again, the intersection with archaeology. Yeah, absolutely fascinating. And um, something I've thought about as a linguist, there's a lot of so-called grey literature out there, archaeological reports, which actually can be relatively contemporary, really. Yeah. Um, and that's another interesting source that linguists rarely tab to actually look at the uh, material evidence that remains, the archaeology, um, yes. and they're trying to interpret some of the sites. So who knows? Maybe one day there'll be an excavation of Daffy's house. Which tells about the secrets of the bottles. Yes. Yeah. So it's absolutely fascinating in several talks, but maybe just exemplified very clearly there just how important this change in our scholarship is becoming, in that things like well, it's not a very interesting source because they're spoofing. Right. Well, it becomes interesting because you can set yes. that in a broader yeah. context. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.